Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for April 14th, 2023. It's Friday and I'm taking your questions and I have to say that most of the questions I received are related to this question of de-dollarization. What's going to happen to the dollar? Can it be saved? Should it be saved? And if so, how? So I will be taking all of those questions in the comments I'll be making. Uh, and you'll you'll see from the total picture that uh, these are the questions I'm trying to answer. Now, we've been covering this shift for years. This is not something new. As is often the case, you have moments in history where uh, long periods pass with seemingly little change, and then all of a sudden, you have an onrush of developments, which are related to the fact that changes that should have occurred did not occur. And that's what we're dealing with right now. For example, the shift that we're seeing is really a post-1963 shift. The assassination of President Kennedy, the move toward control of the U.S. presidency by a system of corporate cartels, of financial influences, of the so-called military-industrial complex that Kennedy was fighting, uh, after 1963, we had moves away from the American system, from a strength, a, an economy which was based on its industrial, agriculture, and infrastructural development, to one which was increasingly uh, services and information, in other words, a consumer economy. Now, this continued under every single president from the post-1971 period, when the Bretton Woods system was ended by Nixon, the gold reserve system was dropped, and every president after that, beginning with Carter all the way through Trump and Biden, we've had an accelerating process of deindustrialization, increasing dependence on cheap labor, including outsourcing from other countries, theft of raw materials from the global south. Uh, deregulation, privatization at home, and free trade agreements internationally. That's what's gone on since 1963. So this is not something that just cropped up. This is something that especially was called to people's attention by Lyndon LaRouche, who repeatedly warned of the dangers of this shift and offered alternatives in terms of regional and international development projects and a shift back to the traditions of the American system. Now, that's based on the idea of, uh, well, I, let me add one other thing. You add to this mixed mix the use of sanctions uh, and the effects of quantitative easing, and you can see why countries are moving away from the dollar. They don't feel safe in a dollar system. And instead, we're seeing agreements between sovereign nations for trade and investment in national currencies, with the emphasis on physical goods backing those currencies, uh, in some cases raw materials such as oil, gold, and so on, but also the development of capital goods, the improvement of, of transportation, of energy production, and so on. And with that, we're seeing the emergence of regional uh, institutions such as the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa Alliance, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Europe, Eurasian Economic Union, the African Union, and so on. Now, the latest development in this was uh, expressed yesterday during President Lula from Brazil uh, meeting with the BRICS Development Bank in China. And Whatever you think of Lula, he was the president of Brazil who brought Brazil into the BRICS, and he's coordinating his actions now increasingly with other BRICS members. Now, here's what he said yesterday, quote, every night I ask myself why all countries have to base their trade on the dollar. Why can't we do trade based on our own currencies? Who was it that decided that the dollar was the currency after the 1971 disappearance of the gold standard, unquote. Now, that was what Lula asked yesterday. And when the dollar was based on a strong U.S. economy, it made sense to allow the other currencies to trade in the dollar, with the idea being that, that they would use that to develop their own economies, the way the countries of Western Europe did. 
But that no longer makes sense because there was never an effort to fully decolonize the global south. That is that there was political independence, but not financial independence, not development aid. And as a result, the global south remained a looting ground to be picked clean by the vultures of the uh, transatlantic countries. So this system no longer makes sense. But the question that comes up, given the power, economic and military, that still exist of those who are responsible for this change, that is, those who are committed to this transformation, there are two questions. One, will they allow a shift, a peaceful shift from a dollar-based unipolar order to agreements among sovereign nation states for trade and investment in other currencies? That's a good question. And the second question is, does this mean that the U.S. will be left isolated and the collapse, the, the, the dollar collapsing in value? Now, the answer to that is very simple. It depends on what the people of the United States do and those in the London Wall Street vassal states of Europe do. Will they shift away from the speculative casino economy back to one which is based on principles of real physical economic development, a completely transformed dynamic? Now, this is what Lyndon LaRouche was addressing over all these many years, the return to physical economy, that is, the uh, credit based on the, the real physical productive capacity of an economy. In other words, real value. What is the real value of a derivative? The very definition of a derivative is that it's derived from something of value, but with no value in itself. But we have quadrillions of dollars of obligations on derivative markets. This was originally set up as a way to try and balance uh, imbalances, but then you needed insurance on derivatives, so-called swap values and so on, to the point that you have huge mountains of unsupportable debt that are backed by printing presses of the central banks with nothing behind it. And that's why we see a collapse of the dollar system. Now, LaRouche said we have to go back to this principle that there has to be something real underlying currencies, because currencies in themselves are nothing but vehicles for trade and, and commerce. Now, to do this, to get away from the hot air economy, the funny money economy, the monopoly economy, whatever you want to call it, he made four proposals, which he called his four laws. One, return to regulated banking, Glass-Steagall. That is that no longer will the federal government or the people of the United States bail out financial institutions that engage in reckless speculation. That you have to separate commercial banks from investment banks. And you protect the commercial banks, but the investment banks, if they want to speculate, they're free to do it but they're also free to take their own losses, eat their own losses. Secondly, a return to a Hamiltonian credit system. What this means is not a system of private central banks like the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, and so on, but national institutions whose credit policies are based on the needs for the general welfare of the population of a sovereign nation which means credit for real goods production, but no credit for speculation. That's the Hamiltonian system that enabled the United States to become the world's preeminent industrial manufacturing power and was adopted toward the end of the 19th century by Germany, Japan, and other nations explicitly based on the American system. And that's what was under attack from the pre-World War I period up to today. That is the British financial system based on control of credit in the hands of private interests has been undermining repeatedly the American system, including here in the United States, including through setting up think tanks and institutions and funding mechanisms that controlled all the political parties of the major countries. And if a, a, popula if a country got out of line, they were subject to coups color revolutions, and wars. The Hamiltonian system works. It works beautifully because it's a system in which 
those who are qualified entrepreneurs, investors, uh, industrialists, innovators, have access to credit, which will increase the total value produced by the, the economy without uh, creating more debt. That is, the debt that's created is paid by the productive capacity that was the, the debt was used to finance. Now, that includes the third point, infrastructure. We need a total revamping of infrastructure, similar to what the Chinese are doing with the Belt and Road Initiative. And fourth, the emphasis on areas of science and technology, which allow for innovative practices to increase the productivity of labor. That's the American system. Now, what's happened to the United States and Western Europe, the economic collapse underway, was not caused by Russia and China. The, it was self-inflicted. It was suicidal policies, including anti-science green policy, including the so-called Great Reset, including the bailout after the 2008 blowout and the continuing quantitative easing to this day. But it's also based on the willingness of the people in the West to tolerate a decent standard of living for themselves protected by wars, coups, and looting, without thinking about the fact that eventually th this will turn against them, that the rest of the world will not tolerate this, but also that the margins of profitability from the system are squeezed out to the point that instead you're living on debt. And I'm not just talking about government debt, but corporate debt, private sector debt, family debt, Families that can't sustain a, a home and, and medical care and, and proper nutrition because of the collapse of the overall economy. Now, the time in which America could profit from this system is coming to an end. This epoch is over. Now, change should not be frightening. We're entering into a new era, but one in which the benefits produced in the past from the American system can be enjoyed by all nations. The central issues that have to be addressed are sovereignty and credit. If you control the credit as a government, if the people control the government rather than private corporate cartels, but if the people control the government, then the instruments of government will ensure that the, the flow of credit to productive enterprises will take place. And then you no longer have to balance between funny money currencies, but you actually have a physical economy backing the money supply. Because money in itself, as I said before, is nothing but a means of exchange. So the central issue with this is sovereignty, having uh, nations that act in the interests of their own people, but recognizing the sovereignty of other nations and the benefit of other nations is to their own benefit. And secondly, a credit system which is based on that concept of sovereignty. And that's what's been under attack by the globalist elite. That's what's the, the central issue behind the Great Reset, to concentrate power in the hands of a small group of billionaires who dictate above national governments the policies that have to be followed. Now, Saturday and Sunday, the 15th and 16th of April, that's tomorrow and Sunday, the Schiller Institute is sponsoring a conference where there will be extensive dialogue about what can be done to make sure that every nation benefits from the principles of, the, uh, of LaRouche's ideas and the American system. The topic, the headline of the conference is, without the development of all nations, there can be no lasting peace. We'll turn that concept around. There can be lasting peace if all nations are able to develop properly as sovereign nations. That's what we'll be discussing. That's what I'm inviting you to join that conversation, to participate in it, bring your friends in on it, your neighbors, your, your family members, because that's the dialogue that must take place. Don't cower in fear of the changes that are coming. Don't hide your head and duck and hope that it won't hit you. It's here. Change is here. But let's make sure it's a change that works for all people of all nations. That's the power that humanity has if we use our innate creative powers that were 
given to us by our Creator. We can creatively act to change nature for the benefit of all nations. And that's what we'll be discussing. I invite you to join us. The link will be to the conference will be in the description section below. Hope to see you there tomorrow.